I have met a lot of billionaire beggars. Life can be enhanced only by enhancing your perception. You're not seeking freedom, don't fool yourself. Human potential is realized only when all bondages are broken and you're able to experience life. Memory, there's an intelligence. This intelligence, if you touch it, then you become universal in nature. This shift from attention to information has caused such a huge damage to human life. Sakalam karuna samaya dipate akilam karuna. Namaskaram and good afternoon to all of you. Well, uh, this fascinating place, incredible design and kind of a dip into the future. So, uh, human attention has uh, shifted to many things that we could do that we are not able to do right now. But one large area which has been left unexplored is uh, the human being itself. Whatever kind of technologies we develop, whatever kind of machines we build, essentially we can only think of doing something which is an extension of our existing faculties. See, if you were made like a tree that is rooted to one place, would you have thought of a bicycle? Hello? Only because you already have mobility, you thought about enhanced mobility. That evolved into many things, only because we can speak. We came up with a microphone and a telephone. If we had no such thing as speech, would we have thought of a microphone and a telephone? Because we can see, we have microscopes and telescopes. Every machine and every gadget we create is only enhancement of existing human faculty. We can see this far, but we want to see that far. We can speak this far, now we want to speak that far. We can hear this far, now we want to hear from somewhere else. Everything, there is no other way for a human brain or human intelligence to function, we will only think of how to enhance this. The purpose of enhancement is essentially a longing to enhance the quality, the content and the profoundness of our life. In this effort, we are doing many things, but 
All these things need to happen in the world, no question about it. But it's extremely important. This gadget, still, even though you may have supercomputers, you may have spacecrafts, you may have all kinds of things, still this machine is the most sophisticated technology on the planet. Do you agree with me? Yes. Question is, have you even read the user's manual? <laughs> Such a sophisticated machine, if you try to operate blindly, it looks like one big problem. This is what is happening to human beings. Being alive itself is becoming a problem for a whole lot of human beings. Just to keep them, <laughs> to keep them peaceful, you have to do so many things. To keep them entertained, you have to do so many things. To keep them happy, you have to do so many things. In these efforts, we are ripping the planet apart. So these efforts are all about enhancement of human life. But a whole lot of things are being used to destroy human life also, because the cutting-edge technology unfortunately is going into military machines. At least by 2025, all of you young people should take it up and see that governments commit beyond 2025, the new technologies will not go into military machines, should be used for other purposes. Hello? Because if we don't do this, then without dropping a bomb, we can kill you in your home from wherever we want. Yes, it's coming. People are talking about such weapons that if we have your DNA, we can poof, kill you wherever you are, anywhere in the world. Right now, people are talking about that kind of technology. Well, this could be used positively also. But the question is into whose hands it will go. So one very important thing that we need to do in the world is, more human beings should invest in turning inward and exploring the nature of the human. This technology, which is the most profound and the highest sophistication that you can think of is right here. If you look at the mechanical factor, there isn't another machine like this. If you think about the electrical systems, there isn't another one like this. If you look at the electronics, there isn't another one like this. Even if you want to call yourself AI, there isn't another one like this. <laughs> there is a huge misunderstanding between what is intellect and what is intelligence. Intellect means, unfortunately, in uh, English language, it's all the same word, mind. But in yogic terminology, intellect is referred to as buddhi. There is another dimension of intelligence called ahankara. There's another dimension of intelligence called manas and another one called chitta. This manas can be further divided into eight parts. Buddhi means the intellect, it's the front end of your intelligence. You want your intellect to be sharp. Hello? If you don't say yes, I'm blessing you <laughs> You want your intelligence to be sharp? Yes. Okay. But now, uh, the moment I give you a sharp knife, you must also have a very steady and conscious hand. Otherwise, this knife will either cut you up or cut somebody else up. Knife is not dangerous. Knife makes life, isn't it? You can use it to save life, to make life or to take life. Yes or no? Same knife. Because which hand holds it? is the important thing. So, buddhi or the intellect, we want it really sharp, as sharp as possible, because it is this aspect of our intelligence which cuts through the world, which deciphers things for us, which gives us logical deductions 
to things that are happening around us. This is that part of intelligence which takes care of your survival process. Because today we have glorified our survival, we call it economy, we call it ambition, we call it progress, but it is survival glorified. I'm just saying, I've met a lot of billionaire beggars. <laughs> They're all billionaires, but still in the same begging mode, every day hankering for one more paisa. Wherever they see, they're licking up the coins that they can see. Now today they call it, uh, you know, crypto coin, but <laughs> it's not just a copper coin, it's… Uh, <laughs> it doesn't exist <laughs> So, uh <laughs> so even if you become a billionaire, you will be still be… still be hankering. Just recently, when I was in United States, I see a young man around me, he's moving around like his tail is on fire. I say, hey, what's the problem with you? What is it that you're trying to do? Sadhguru, I want to earn billion dollars, billion dollars. I said, don't worry, tomorrow I will give you a billion dollars. Really, Sadhguru, you will give me a billion dollars? I said, yes. He had come with eight of his friends. I said, look at these eight guys, I am going to give all of them ten billion dollars, you will get one billion dollar. Sadhguru, why Sadhguru, they're getting ten billion… Are you only asked for one billion? <laughs> so with one billion, if the other eight guys have ten billion, this guy still is a beggar. So the moment we try to enhance our life with accumulations, whether it's money or knowledge or relationships or wealth, it doesn't matter what. If you believe that you can enhance your life by accumulating something, then you've lost your track. Life can be enhanced only by enhancing your perception and profoundness of experience. Otherwise, it'll not be enhanced. You can sit on the top of the mountain and still be frustrated. You can sit in a palace and still be miserable. Yes or no? Yes. Because enhancement of life will not happen with accumulations. Accumulations can create some amount of comfort and convenience, some ability to act in the world, but it will not enhance your life in your experience that if you sit here, you will not feel any enhanced by… because of your bank balance. Your enhancement is only because this person sitting next to you has nothing. You're just enjoying his poverty. Hello? <laughs> Essentially, people are enjoying what other people don't have. If I enjoy what you don't have, I call this sickness, not success. Hello? None of you have eaten for three days <laughs> No, just an example. It may happen, I'm preparing you for twenty-five years later. Future, you know, is a future museum, I'm just telling you <laughs> So none of you have eaten for three days. I've had a nice meal and come, I'm very happy <laughs> because uh, None of you have eaten, but I've eaten well, I'm very happy. You call this happiness or sickness? Unfortunately, we have spread this sickness across the world that we enjoy what others don't have. Someone, uh, you know, I was walking in a hotel in Delhi where one… one part of the floor of that hotel is taken up by the De Beers Diamond Company. So there's a lady, one of the Delhi ladies walking with me and says, Sadhguru, will you buy me a diamond? <laughs> she knows I don't have a rupee. <laughs> I said, uh, see, uh, why do you want a stone? Huh? You will get the stone when you're dead. 
why a stone now? Why do you want to carry a stone? No, no, I'm talking about diamond. I said, for me it's just a stone. No, no, diamond is beautiful. Diamond is not beautiful. We can cut a piece of glass in such a way it looks far more beautiful than a diamond. You're not buying diamond for its beauty. You're buying it because it's scarce and everybody cannot have it. Hello? Oh, who is that? Who was that? Ah, you got it. That's a time of your life when you must get this <laughs> So, uh, you own something, not because it's useful to you. If it's useful to you, you enjoy ha using it, please have it, whatever it is. But you are having it only because others don't have it. This is a sickness. This will naturally happen to you if you enhance your intellect without enhancing other aspects of your intelligence. Because the nature of the intellect is to accumulate. Today you call it as information, you call it as data, Essentially, it is accumulation and because of this information, we have given up on human attention. It is only with human attention you can open any door in the universe. Keenness of your attention will do that. But today, right now I've looked up uh, the Wikipedia of all of you guys, I know everything about you, I don't have to look at you. This is how we have become. Hello? because I have information in my head, I don't have to pay attention. See, whatever information, let's say if I take one of you as an example, if I have all the information about you, about your life, still it could be wrong this moment because a human being is a possibility. This moment you may be something other than what information I have, isn't it so? Yes. If I am not open to that possibility, I'm missing the whole human being because a data doesn't make life. Data is the footprint of life, not life. If you see my footprint, that's not me, isn't it? And the whole… once you are thinking of accumulations, the next thing is you want to leave a footprint. Those who want to leave a footprint in this world, they shall never fly. So intelligence is of various kinds. There are ways to realize things about the nature of the human being beyond intellectual understanding. This happened. One day, <laughs> are you introducing yourself? <laughs> No, I thought you were introducing yourself <laughs> So, a man had a gala fight with his wife. And then uh, he wandered out, little frustrated, not going, knowing where to go. He just walked around and uh, then uh, he saw a sadhu in India. Sadhus, these are mendicants, these are full-time spiritual seekers. They're just always traveling. One of the rules for a sadhu is he never puts it… puts his head, head down in the same place for more than three days. That means he should not gather any kind of relationship with anything, he must be moving all the time, no gathering. So a sadhu was uh, settling down under a tree just outside the town. He saw sadhu settling down and he looked so peaceful and wonderful. He went to him and uh, said, See, uh, I'm having trouble with my wife. I lost my peace and uh, I need some… something. 
that will enhance my life. So Sadhu asked, uh, what do you mean something, what do you want? He said, if I get some treasure, I could enhance my life. Then uh, Sadhu had a, you know, a shoulder bag. He put his hand into it and pulled out a skull-sized diamond, the largest diamond on the planet. He said, here it is, take it and go. He looked at this, you giving this to me? He said, yeah, take it and go. You wanted treasure, take it and go. So he took this and started walking towards the town. Then he thought if the people see this, somebody's going to kill him. So he hid it in his clothes and looking here, there fearfully he went home. Then he thought about telling his wife, then he knew if he tells his wife, she will tell his, her mother, her sister, her friend, <laughs> this is too dangerous. So he went into the bedroom and put it under the pillow. And uh, wife said, why don't you, why are you going to bed? Why don't you come and eat something? He said, no, no, I'm not hungry. And slept with such a big rock beneath your pillow, he couldn't sleep and he was hungry. He struggled the whole night, he couldn't sleep. Morning 4.30, he woke up and just he thought, if the sadhu just has to pull out this diamond and give it to me like this, what is it? He checked it, is it really diamond? And it was a genuine diamond. Then he took it and went back to the sadhu. Sadhu had just started his morning, you know, in 3.40. Always yogis start their sadhana at 3.40 in the morning because it's a special time. So, uh, he was beginning his sadhana, his yoga. So he went and said, Sadhu Maharaj, I just asked for treasure. You pulled out such a big diamond and gave it away to me without a second thought. If you have to give away this kind of treasure to me, what is it that you got which is more valuable than this? <laughs> then Sadhu smiled and said, oh, you're looking for that one, come and sit here now. <laughs> because the value of being human is that you're alive, and this aliveness is not just a physical phenomena. If you know little intellect, it becomes a psychological phenomena. If you know some emotion, it becomes an emotional phenomena. If you dig deeper, it becomes a life phenomena which is cosmic in nature, limitlessly possible. Because the limitations are set. If you're identified with the body, this is all you are. If you're identified with your mind, this much you are maybe a library at the most. If you're identified with your emotions, four, five, ten, fifteen people around you. But if you're not identified with any of these things, you have all these things. You have a body, of course. You have a psychological process, you have an emotional process. But if you're not identified with it, then living here is a cosmic process, a limitless possibility. Every human being is competent and capable of this. No human being is incapable of this. It's just lack of focus, lack of priority, that's all. What they're looking for, that's all that's happening. So why is it not naturally happening? It would naturally happen without even looking for it, if only if you were not identified with anything. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, where did you learn all this? What about this? How did you get this? How did you get that? Because everybody knows I'm quite illiterate. I don't read, I don't listen to anything, nothing. Where does it come from? So this is all it is, that what you identify with, you become that. If you get identified with this vessel, very strongly identified, this is my vessel, this is my vessel, if somebody takes a hammer and took, hits it, your heart will break. Yes or no? Yes. So this is the power of identity. This is the second layer of intelligence, it's called ahankara, identity. This is something totally neglected in modern education system, because how your intellect will function simply depends on how you're identified. If you're identified very strongly as a male person, it functions that way. If you're identified as a woman, 
it functions that way. If you're identified with a nation, it functions that way. If you're identified with a religion, it functions that way. If you're identified with a family, it functions that way. Whichever way you identify yourself, your whole intelligence will function that way, isn't it? To a point where you're willing to live and die for it. Yes or no? So this is how powerful identity is, but we are allowing that to be formed just like that, as with associations, we are becoming identified with this and that. So, in the yogic culture, when… when a child becomes twelve years of age, first thing we do is that the child should take a cosmic identity, a limitless identity, identify with the universe in which you exist. We are talking about a universe and cosmos because if you say, stay here without identity, you don't know how to be because intelligence will not function like that. Your intellect cannot function without an identity, it needs that intent. So you give it a cosmic identity because you do not know the boundaries of the cosmos, where it begins, where it ends. So it's almost being limitless. Conceptually, it is a limitless possibility. In reality, there may be a limit, but we are not able to see those limits, so it's limitless at least in our perception. So the second dimension of intelligence which we call as ahankara, which is identity-based, if you manage this in a limitless way, let us say you have a universal identity, now your intellect functions in a certain way. If you're identified with just this one person, your intellect functions just all the time trying to protect these two things, if you're identified with four people, it just functions within that four. If you're identified with ten people, just with those… within those ten. But if you're identified in a limitless way or with a cosmic identity, your intellect functions seamlessly. This at least you must do to yourself. Otherwise, you are a free bird but caged. The state of humanity is like this. A bird which was living in a cage for a long time, now the door is blown away, but out of sheer habit, it never flies. It sits right there because it's gotten used to that. This is the state of humanity right now because for all creatures on the planet, nature has put two lines. Within those two lines, they must live and die. But for the human being, there is no top line. But still, everybody is trying to put a line. You're trying to make a bond with something or somebody because you like bondage. You're not seeking freedom, don't fool yourself. People are too scared of freedom. Hello? Yes. But freedom is the highest value, isn't it? The whole Eastern cultures come from this that the only value is mukti or liberation or freedom, that's the only value. Everything else should serve to make you free. Because human potential is realized only when all bondages are broken and you're able to experience life. People are afraid, parents are saying, you must have bondage with me to their children. Why? Why can't somebody be with you by choice? Why should they be with you because they're bound to you? Hello? Is it not wonderful if somebody is with you because they're choosing to be with you right now? They could go anywhere, but they're choosing to be with you, that is wonderful. They're here because they're bound to you, that's a terrible way of keeping people with you. Hello? But unfortunately, everybody is seeking bondage because they want to concretize Anything beautiful happens in their life, they want to concretize that. The moment you concretize that, life has gone out of it. See, if you meet another human being and little something beautiful happened, now you want to capture it because you are still an accumulator of things. You think you, may, you can capture that emotion, capture that experience and put it in a concrete box and have it forever. Life doesn't work like that. If you want flowers in your garden, every day you must water it, you must look at it, you must care for it. Otherwise, you will end up with plastic flowers, which are guaranteed for five years. <laughs> and it's very useful, very useful there. 
If you have plastic flowers in your house, when your guests come, you can arrange it. If your children are not behaving, you can take it and whack it <laughs> and put it back again. <laughs> These flowers are trouble. In a day, three times you have to look at it, in Dubai, five times you must look at it. <laughs> okay, whether they are okay or not, what do they need? Unnecessary care, but it's life. Hello? Yes. And the only and only value that you have to yourself, that is your life, isn't it? Not because you're a body, not because you're shapely like this, not because you have so much brain, because your life, all these things matter, isn't it so? Because I see a lot of people... <laughs> see, your hair is wonderful, but only if you're alive, isn't it? <laughs> Hello? Yes. Your nose is also wonderful, only if you're alive. Yes, yes or no? Have you ever been to any funeral? Yes. You've seen some dead people. So this guy is like this. <laughs> this guy is like this. You go and tell him ten billion dollars. <laughs> He's not interested. You tell him this big diamond. You tell him mountain of gold. You tell him most beautiful woman. Tell him whatever you want. Once life has been taken out of it, nothing matters, isn't it? So I'm saying even now, the only thing that you have is life. Rest is all your imagination. It's just your imagination. Simply some utility things, you have made it into something else in your mind. It's only in your mind. Existentially, you have nothing other than life right now. Only if you're alive, people who love you also will sit next to you. If you're dead, even they will get up, scream and run away <laughs> Yes, they will <laughs> So, this one precious thing, has it been experienced? Has it been looked at? Has it been explored? No, we are just busy doing metaverse now. I'm not against any technology, I'm for technology. But you must be rooted in this life and then explore other things. If you're not you're rooted in this life, you will lose it if you start exploring something else. First you must be rooted here, then you do all the other things. Now we can make everything in a way to enhance this life. Everything to make this life or to create an ecosystem where this life can flourish. So, the third dimension of intelligence is called as manas. It is a huge silo of memory. There are… we identify eight forms of memory. I will not go into all these things, but to tell you simply, there is evolutionary memory in you. Hello? There is? Yes. See, for next three days if you eat dog food, just for experiment I'm saying. <laughs> if you eat dog food, will you become a dog? No. Because there is genetic memory here, there is uh, evolutionary memory here, which clearly says this is a human being. Do what you want, it will not change its form, isn't it? Because the memory is established. Your body has a form only because of the memory, isn't it? Now, you may… do you remember… do you remember how your great-great-great-great-grandfather was? No. You have not seen him, you don't remember. But most probably his nose is sitting on your face, <laughs> yes? Because your body remembers. Your body remembers not only five generations ago, even five thousand years ago, how your forefathers were, from skin tone to everything it remembers, isn't it? So what you call as my genetics is again memory. Like this, there are eight silos of memory, conscious memory, unconscious memory, articulate memory, inarticulate memory, like this, eight forms of memory. It's only because this silo of memory is there, intellect is active in the front end. However sharp your intellect is, if there is no data, it will, by, it will be like your computer without a hard disk. It is because of this memory, intellect is functional in the front end. But now, 
how this information will function in the front end depends upon the second aspect of intelligence which is identity. If you're identified as I'm this nation, I'm an Indian, I'm an Indian, I'm an Indian, I'm willing to fight and die for this, isn't it? How strongly you're identified makes you that much limited to that identity. Whether it's a nationality, race, religion, gender, you name it, we have taken thousands of identities. But the moment you're identified, this identity will de decide whatever information you have, how it functions within you is determined by this identification. Or to give it a analogy, if you see buddhi or the intellect as a sharp knife, the hand that holds it is the identity. The memory is deep inside. So these three dimensions of intelligence normally happening almost like an automatic process. If you bring awareness to it, if you bring consciousness to it, there are many miraculous things you can do. But if you go a little deeper, there is another dimension of intelligence there, which is unsullied by memory, an intelligence without memory. Because memory is a great possibility, who you are right now, you are a man, you are a woman, you are this, that, and so many things in the society, everything is by memory, isn't it? Somebody is your mother, somebody is your father, somebody is your child, all memory, if I erase your mem memory, if you look at this person, you don't know who she is. Hello? It doesn't matter, she may be your mother, she may be your daughter, she may be anything, but you cannot recognize her if you just take away your memory. So beyond memory, there's an intelligence without memory, unsullied by memory. This intelligence, if you touch it, it's called chitta, then you become universal in nature. Your experience of life blows away in a much bigger than what your body is, what your thought process is, what your emotions are, in a much larger scope. Now you know the universe in a different way. Now you know the life process in a different way. Now you understand the phenomena of life out of which you're just a small outcrop. You're just a small outcrop of a phenomena of life that's happening. It is in this context today that we are talking about soil because we have forgotten who you are right now, even physically, physiologically, who you are right now, even in terms of evolutionary terms, you are just a consequence of the life that's happening in the first fifteen to eighteen inches of soil. There are many ways to look at this. One simple way is, nearly a billion years ago, they say for the first time, a very smart algae or a fungi, we don't know which one, because we still don't know whether it was a cave man or a cave woman who first learned how to cook food with fire. Are you sure about this? Everybody says it's a caveman, but uh, ladies <laughs> It's a woman who sets fire usually <laughs> I'm speaking the truth <laughs> See, uh, there are many ways to set fire. We can set fire to cook, we can set fire for a funeral, we can set fire to destroy your ho home. We can use fire in so many ways. But generally, women use fire in a constructive way. It is a man who threw a bomb most of the time <laughs> okay, in a destructive way. No, no, I d be nice to men, what are you doing? So, we don't know who, it, who did it, similarly we do not know whether it's this algae or a fungi, but for the first time, they discovered a way of cooking their food with the perpetual energy of the sun. That phenomena today we called as photosynthesis. Before this phenomena of photosynthesis started, the oxygen content in the atmosphere was a shade over one percent. Today it is twenty-one percent. That's the only reason you and me are here. That is the only re reason this kind of life became possible. This complex life became possible because atmospheric oxygen is an important part of that. 
but in the last thousand years, we have removed eighty-five percent of photosynthesis on the planet. That means eighty-five percent of the oxygen manufacturing factory on the planet, we have removed. Does it look like a suicide mission to you? So this is what we are trying to reverse with safe soil. I know seventy-one percent of the land is under agriculture. When… when there is crop, there is some amount of photosynthesis. When there is no crop, there must be a cover crop or there must be a tree crop which is partially covering the land. One way or the other, there must be maximum amount of photosynthesis on the planet because it also sequesters carbon, it also keeps the land rich and it feeds all the other organisms, planet stays alive. This is what Save Soil is about. I think we have a bit of time, if you have a question, we can handle that. Thank you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. Uh, Sadhguru, Inner Engineering and Shambhavi Mahamudra. So, when we were just… you were saying about intelligence and the dimensions, I was… I've been wanting to know how Shambhavi Mahamudra, you know, how does it help with the dimensions of intelligence? You know. It's created so much joy and balance, but the different aspects, whether it's arm chanting or how, no, no. how does it work? How does it work? Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a specific question, may not mean much to many people, but uh, what Shambhavi means is, there is, a met there is a simple method with which one aspect of it is, it transforms your chemistry into your blissful chemistry because this is the most complex and sophisticated chemical factory on the planet. Do you agree with me? Yes. Now the question is only, are you a good manager of this chemical factory or are you a lousy manager? If you're a good manager, you will make these chemicals blissful chemistry. If you're a lousy manager, you will make it into anxious chemistry, bitter chemistry, hateful chemistry, something else like this that is not good for you. Another aspect of Shambhavi is the most significant aspect of Shambhavi is if you sit here, if you are in Shambhavi, you will see your body is here. What you see as your psychological process is little away from this and you are little away from these two processes. Your physiology and your psychology, your physiological process and your psychological process and who you are, there's a little space. Once there is a space between you and your body, between you and your mind, this is the end of suffering because you know only two kinds of suffering, physical suffering, mental suffering. Do you know any other form of suffering? Oh, you haven't found any <laughs> <laughs> So physical suffering, mental suffering, once there is a little bit of space between you and the body, between you and the mind, this is the end of suffering. Once there is no fear of suffering, only and only then you will walk full stride in your life. Otherwise, no matter what you're doing, carefully observe yourself and see, no matter what you're doing, what will happen to me is always the thing which limits you, isn't it? Yes. That means suffering may come. If there is no possibility of suffering, Whatever happens, this is how you will be. If you had this assurance, would you do a lot more things in your life? Yes. You must. That freedom should come. For this, you need a little space between you and your body, between you and your mind, because when you're in it, you never know. See, human beings walk this planet for thousands of years, but they couldn't figure it was round. Because even now if you walk up and down this hall, planet flat or round, tell me? It is flat in your experience. So, when is it that this became clear? When they started navigating the oceans, to some extent they got some idea. But once they started flying, very clear. Once we went up and stood on the moon and looked down, hundred percent clear. <laughs> Why? Because of the distance. 
Once you create a little distance between you and your body, between you and your mind, you know the full mechanism of this body and your mind, how it functions and what it is. Without knowing that, if you ride this life, then you will be blundering. See, anything, anything, the phone that you carry, the more you know about it, the better you can use it. Is it so? Why don't you think it is so with this? The more you know about this, the better you can use it, isn't it? So this is all it means. If you want to know this, either you can search the libraries of the world and get all bits and pieces of information, but you yourself are here with a living body, living human being. If you want to know about this, should you turn inward or should you read a book? I'm asking, to you go to the library? You should turn inward because you yourself are life. You shouldn't ask me, what is life? People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you seem to know everything? I don't know anything, this is a secret, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I know only one thing. I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate nature. I'm only talking about this. People think I'm talking about them. People think I'm talking about the world. People think I'm talking about the universe. I know only this. I'm only talking about this. This is the nature of life. If you know one piece of life fully, you know the whole universe because fundamentally it's the same thing, only in complexity and sophistication it may multiply, but it's essentially the same thing. See, if we study an amoeba, we can know you because the fundamental design is same. It is far more complex, you are far more complex and sophisticated than an amoeba, but fundamentally you are the same. So, if you know an atom, in some way you know the whole universe because essentially it's the same structure, but more and more complex and sophistication happens. So, knowing the nature of your existence is far, far more important and with this we don't have to blunder around exploring technologies, we can specifically come out with technologies that we exactly want because if you know this, you know the highest technology in the universe right now. You just have to manifest the same thing in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Sadhguru, good afternoon. Please take the microphone, anybody. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Sadhguru. That's a phenomenal journey that you took us on. You're easily among the best storytellers on the planet. I'm sorry? You're easily among the best storytellers on the planet and that's an amazing journey that you've taken us all on. Yeah, I'm and talking about me and you're calling it a story <laughs> <laughs> It's… life is a one long story but uh, Sadhguru, the reason I'm standing up to talk today is to introduce you to my son. Uh, he's thirty years old now, uh, he's uh, never spoken in his entire life and he started communicating through a communication board uh, about three years ago. And he was uh, pretty much written off as somebody who didn't have much of intellect, uh, chitta, buddhi as he called it. Um, about three years ago when he started writing, he started writing poetry. And uh, I'd like to offer this scroll to you. It's a poem that he wrote about a couple of weeks ago which went viral on the Save the Soil Conscious Planet website. <laughs> That's for you, Vicky. I'd just like to get him to hand over the scroll to you if you don't mind. Oh, you can read it from there, no? Oh sure, I could. Bobby? Okay, whichever way you want to read it, it's fine. I have poem, I can read it. Vicky, uh, Vikram wrote this poem a couple of weeks ago after he heard your speech, uh, your talk, uh, Sadhguru. It's called Golden Sludge. What's his name, please? Vikram. Vikram. You can hear me, Vikram? Yeah. Vicky? Sadhguru is speaking Vikram? to you. Okay, please. Golden Sludge. Will you miss the earthy aroma of the first rain? Brown puddles of nature's streamy brew? When it's time to feed the species its seasonal grain, reaping earthen bounty for its motley crew? Amazonian lungs heaving, breathing, stifling smog, snuffing out paradise from its God-given landscape. 
Who not your self-indulgent quest to conquer run amok? Leave not our motherly feeding bowl with little left to scrape. Acrid plumes of acid rain burning already scorched earth, saplings burnt in the surrogate tracts of machine-tilled factories. Snuffing life's will for birth and rebirth, drowning wails of coming generations' soulless stories. The ground below making way for six-foot coffins, worms dwelling in lifeless habitat, sentencing the planet back to its arid origins. Wake up to feed the swan before it shakes, chokes in the starving weeds. That's by Vikram. Sir, I feel you, Indian theory has incarnation and what? you tell many times, incarnation, uh -huh. incarnation of Rama and uh, Krishna. I feel you are the incarnation of Adi Sankaracharya. Oh. Adi Sankaracharya who gave a very big impact on, on, on the world. You are the soul of Adi Sankaracharya. Why are you Adi making me somebody other than who I am? What I feel, <laughs> what I feel, this is what I feel. And no. Because soul gave us structure, you, you saw soil, soil gave us structure to us, but we have a soil, a soul, soul comes. Oh. You are the soul of Adi Sankarachari and different structure given by the soil. That is, that is why you are saving the soil. Okay, okay, sir. Second thing. Okay, no, 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 one Second, theory, my, one th no, 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 one theory is enough, yeah. please, sir. One, one question I have, no. I have one question only. We'll come to that, let me explain this Adi yes. Sankara soul. <laughs> See, <laughs> I was… Uh, I was in Bahrain, uh, four days ago I was in Bahrain. One of these wonderful ladies uh, who is doing a lot of work, she's a seka and she's doing a lot of work and she has a whole bunch of young women team. She says, uh, see this girl, this is an angel, she does this, 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 this is another angel, she does this, this. I said, hey, stop doing this. These are human beings who came by normal birth and they're doing fine. Tell me they're wonderful human beings. Why are you going on saying they're angels from somewhere? <laughs> so essentially because very few human beings utter the word human proudly. How many human beings say, I'm a human being with pride? They say, oh, I'm only human <laughs> Now. <laughs> Now I'm asking you, is it true in terms of evolution, you're on top of the world? Hello? Yes. Even above monkeys <laughs> Those of you who are up there, I'm just saying, is it terrestrial life? <laughs> so, uh, you're on top of the world, but you're not feeling like top of the world because you've just not learned to explore this, you are going by this memory. Now Adi Shankara came a thousand years ago, well a spectacular man, no question about it. But you don't believe that every generation can produce spectacular human beings. You believe they have to come back. The same people have to come back again and again, they need not come back. Every generation if you cultivate a generation properly, every generation can produce thousands of spectacular human beings. Unfortunately, there has been a drought for some time. 
So you go on thinking, if anybody of some significance comes, oh, he must be <laughs> that one. No, that one is gone and it's good it's gone. Because after thousand years, if he still lives here, it's not good for anybody. <laughs> he… he did his wonderful work during his lifetime and he's gone, let him go. Why is it that we are such a barren humanity that we cannot spe produce spectacular human beings in this generation? Why not? Look at this boy. So don't go on pulling back the dead <laughs> Leave the dead to the dead, you know, somebody said. <laughs> it's very important because if you don't leave the dead to the dead, you will not know how to value life. Because this is a very bad habit most of you have, that people that you were not on talking terms with when they were alive, the moment they die, they become so wonderful. Whole lot of people are doing this, isn't it? When they were alive, they were bickering with each other, can't talk to each other. But once they are dead, oh, my father was so… such a fantastic man. When he was alive, you couldn't stand him. So I'm saying, life is very brief. When people are alive, whatever kind of nonsenses they have, just make the best out of it. Because they will be dead or you will be dead soon. Hello? When I say soon, I'm not wishing you a quick death. <laughs> I bless you with a long life, but if you're joyful, it's going to be very soon. Only if you're miserable, it's going to be very long. <laughs> yes? yes? So, this… this habit of plucking fruits from the past, you must give it up because if you pluck fruits from the past, you cannot eat it, you can only imagine and show it. Hmm? See, I plucked a fruit from ten years ago from a tree. Here I have it, do you see the apple? Hello? I can talk about it, talk about it, talk about it and make it real in your mind, but you will not be nourished by it. Yes ma'am, please take the microphone. Um, you talked about uh, the different layers of intelligence and concerning the second layer you said it's an identification with the universe which you teach children when they are 12 years old. So my question is why 12 and how do you teach them? Till they're 12, don't mess with them <laughs> Because <laughs> in the yogic culture, till they're 12, we don't believe in teaching them anything. No ABC, no one, two, three, no nothing. Just eat well, sleep well, learn to behave well and just be there, grow well. Without… before the brain grows to its capacity, if you start putting too much silly knowledge into their head, you're in some way crippling the human being. Whether you understand this or not, most schools in the world are crippling the humanity with good intention, of course, because the most horrible things happen always with good intention. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> so, till twelve, don't teach them anything. Let them just absorb the world around them because if you do not teach them anything, teach means what? You don't load them with information. If you do not put any information, a child will wonder, look at everything with great interest. You say, oh, this is a butterfly species, the species number twenty-one. <laughs> he won't even look at the butterfly. <laughs> Otherwise, if he looks at the butterfly, he's being flies with the butterfly. That must happen. That must happen to you even today. Hello? Yes. But because you know knowledge <laughs> You know, there is a… <laughs> The story, the biblical story, the first story, it seems there was a dumb couple <laughs> called Adam and Eve. <laughs> they did not know what to do with each other and they ate this fruit from a particular tree. What tree was that? 
tree of knowledge. Apple, the word apple means in ancient English, apple means just fruit. Any fruit was called apple. So they ate from the fruit of knowledge, I'm sorry, from the tree of knowledge. And it seems, see, your parents are telling you, you must eat the fruit of knowledge. Your teachers are insisting you must eat the fruit of knowledge. Everybody around you is telling the same thing, but it seems God told you, do not eat from the tree of knowledge, you shall fall. And they ate that and they fell. It's not about that Adam and Eve, every Adam, every Eve falls because they collect information about life. See, right now it's like this. Let's say I had met you twenty-five years ago. Who is old enough for that? I'm just looking. I can't point at the ladies. Uh, okay, somebody. I met you twenty-five years ago. And at that moment, you were doing something that I did not like. Then I thought, this is a bad guy. Now twenty-five years I did not see you. Today you came and sat here. Then I think, why is this fellow here? In twenty-five years you might have become the most beautiful human being. But my mind will not allow that. My mind will say, this guy is not okay. So this is knowledge. So it will not allow you to experience what is there. This is why this shift from attention to information has caused such a huge damage to human life. It's very important a child develops attention. If you don't teach anything, more attention. When uh, she's not here now, she's gone somewhere else. She was here just now, my daughter, she's here somewhere in this building and uh, Oh, she's here <laughs> Okay. So, uh, when uh, she's three, three and a half months old, she's traveling with me all over the place. Then I saw all adults have a compulsive need to teach something. When they see a child, they want to teach something. They want to teach all that nonsense that did not work in their life <laughs> See, between a child and an adult, generally, not always, generally, who is more joyful? <laughs> Who should be a consultant for life? <laughs> only thing is, only thing as an adult you have is, you have seniority. You came a few years early. Beyond it is nothing, so you're just bullying around because you came early. Just like in schools and other things, these habits have come now. Just because you came there to two years earlier than somebody, you torture somebody. This is what adults are doing to children. Hello? Yes. So I said, nobody teach her anything. But Sadhguru, what about one, two, three? I said, no one, two, three. Then somebody comments, then she won't even know how many fingers she has. I said, what does it matter? If she thinks this is ten or she thinks this is a million, what does it matter to me? If she knows how to use these ten fingers, that's all. And anyway, who told you this is ten? You just called it ten, I call it a million. What's your problem? <laughs> and uh, can we teach her some rhymes? Mary had a little lamb. Say, I don't care whether Mary had a lamb or not. <laughs> no, Mary had a little lamb, no ABC, no one, two, three, just leave her alone. If you want to play with her, play with her. Otherwise, just leave her alone <laughs> because this nonsense of wanting to impart this nonsensical stuff, which is all about survival, only things adults know which children do not know is they know a few tricks of survival, they know the marketplace. That a child will learn when time comes. The important thing is you learn to become an exuberant, joyful, profound life. This is most important. Because that's all you got, you got nothing other than life. If life is taken of you, out of you, there is nothing else in you, isn't it? If you do not give significance to that, then you will have everything and you will have nothing. This is what modern societies are. Everything, the way you cannot imagine. Hundred years ago, even royalty could not have what ordinary citizens today have, isn't it? 
But are they bursting with joy? No, there is a mental illness pandemic, I believe. <laughs> See, you can say mental illness, you can give it any number of names and descriptions. Essentially, it is a case of your intelligence has turned against you. Yes or no? Yes. You call it stress, anxiety, this, that, whatever. Your intelligence is not working for you, it's ag working against you. Once your intelligence is working against you, no force in the universe can save you. Very important, your body, your intelligence works for you. Hello? Yes. If it starts working against you, tell me who can save you. You think a doctor can save you? No. Nobody can save you. So this is very important that we do not replace attention with information. You must strive to do this, to develop more attention. Attention means, what should I attend to? Should I look at a pretty woman? Should I look at a flower? Should I look at uh, sunset, sunrise? That's not the point. Attention is an illumination. If you turn on the light, does it just shine on this person or that person selectively? It's just on. If the light is on, everything that is there is seen. Just like that, if your attention is on, everything that is there here is seen. Just now somebody was asking me, Sadhguru, when you're riding for this thirty thousand kilometers, are you listening to music? I said, no, why would I do that? <laughs> I'm not listening to music. Sometimes I'm uh, having interviews and stuff on the motorcycle, I'm doing all these media interviews. Even I'm not doing that, I'm just alert. That's the whole thing about riding. You just alert. To what? To everything. Otherwise, you won't live to be sixty-five when you're on a motorcycle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>